Okay, so we will be in Jeremiah, finish up chapter 4. Um, this, when did this happen? Okay, so this prophecy happens roughly as the same as the other ones that we looked at under King Josiah. Uh, during or after the Reformation. Yeah, 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 look, we already looked at it with all the other ones. Um, but Babylon is probably not a direct threat at this point. Now, it, it possibly, it, it, this happened when Babylon was rising in power. Um, because they saw it as a threat coming that was going to not be good. So the main theme of this, of this uh, prophecy is that God's judgment from the north and Jeremiah's grief over the coming judgment. Um, it was given to Judah in the south, and we'll get started with that. Eli, are you comfortable with reading in front of people? Yes. Okay, can you read that? Mm -hmm. uh, some of the words are cut off where you can't see. Ooh, the that's going to be a problem. Born, assemble ourselves? Yeah. Going? The first thing I'll... Is that... Bringing disaster. You got it. Good. Uh, declare in Judah, proclaim in Jerusalem, and say, Blow the ram's horn, horn. of the land, horn. cry out loudly, and say, Assemble us ourselves, and let's flee to, to the fortified cities. Lift up a signal flag, flag toward to Zion. Don't go cover. Don't stand still, for I am bringing disaster from the north, crushing blow. A lion has gone up from his thicket, a, a destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his lair to make our, your land a waste. Your cities will be reduced to uninhabitable ruins. So when it says blow the horn there, it's talking about, uh, th that's basically showing, a, uh, it's like an emergency signal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically get to safety, but it's a national one, so hey, you all are screwed. Uh, Gracie, you want to read that one? Right when you took a bite, awesome. Woo! You're terrible. <laughs> and because of this, set on sackcloth, mourn and well, for the Lord's burning, burning anger has not turned away from us. On that day, this is is the Lord's declaration, declaration. The king and the officials will lose their courage. The priests will tremble in fear. And the prophets will be scared to say, I said, Oh no, Lord God, you have certainly deceived this people in Jerusalem by announcing you will perhaps be God's sword is at your heel. So it says here about sackcloth. Sackcloth was a bland and cheap, coarse clo clothing. clothing. Um, it was basically used to show humility. Um, so, like if they were in a time of fasting or that kind of stuff, they'd put on sackcloth. And uh, it was also used to show mourning. Uh, mourning and humility kind of went hand in hand. So, like, if you were at a funeral, you would put on sackcloth. Um, so that brings up a very interesting question because it's, oh, no, the part that Grace was said perfectly. <laughs> Lord God, you have certainly deceived this people and you. So, so that brings up a very interesting question. Is God deceitful? Um, does anybody want to get throw out a, 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 what they think before I look at this? Um, Go ahead. Okay. Um, kind of, but d being deceitful is more like um, um, it's kind of like lying, but it's where you're doing it with the intent. It's not just lying. It's more of like what? Like kind of like a lying with malice. You're you're being deceitful, conniving. You know, trying to you know. <laughs> Okay, so what are your thoughts then on this part where Jeremiah says, Oh no, Lord God, you have certainly deceived this people and Jerusalem by announcing you will have peace while a sword is at our throats. Sorry? Sorry, I feel like he's not like completely lying because he didn't say like you will have peace in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying it was uh, it was something that was going to eventually happen. That's fine. Okay. Gracie, what were you going to say? Uh, it's what you guys were reading. That's that's the whole thing. So, because I mean, where, where did they find um, you will have peace? Uh, where where did they get that information? Where else? Did where did Jeremiah get it? Yeah. Well, now hold on. Um, because I feel like it's in context of why he said that. Well, we started tonight at the beginning of the pro of this prophecy. Right. So. 
to look at context, that's kind of a little bit of a loaded question. Um, I just want to know what the full verses where God says you will have peace. Right, but remember that Jeremiah isn't written in order. So these are all these were all the prophecies that we've looked at were about the same time, but we can, I can't give you a, like each one in order. All we have is this is the prophecy and that's the line that he says. No, 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 no. He's talking. He's talking. So God is saying this on on that day. This is the Lord's declaration. The king and the officials will lose their courage. The priests will tremble in fear, and the prophets will be scared speechless. Then I said, Jeremiah is talking. So then I said, in response to what God just said, I said, Oh no, Lord God, you have certainly deceived this people in Jerusalem by announcing you will have peace while the sword is at our throats. That that is the context. Jeremiah is is uh, retorting to what God is saying. Well, I don't know if you're my question or no, it, well, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a loaded question. Once again, we, we've looked at the other prophecies over the past couple of weeks, mm -hmm. so we could say that. But in the context of this prophecy, it's kind of not really specified. Okay. So. So he has prophesied previously. That we don't know because Jeremiah. What are you not getting about oh, this, Grace? I'm trying to get upset here. Look, uh, okay. Jeremiah is not in chronological order. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, well, based off that information, I the like lack of information you mean? Because <laughs> I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> okay. One, like what Jesse was saying, we'll have peace later on. Okay. Or two, it could have been where they were supposed to have peace, but because they wronged God, they couldn't have that peace. Okay. Or it could be three. God was being sarcastic with them, like, oh, yeah, you'll have peace. Because hmm. we've seen in, in places where God is kind of sarcastic about his people. <laughs> you know, where they were Salty. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Anything else? No? Okay. So I, I think that you guys had some really good things to say. And uh, I'm going to give you my opinion, but uh, I'm not trying to discredit what you guys said. Um, so, first off, there are there are five basic ideas um, that different people will say, and I'm gonna kind of rank them. So, the the most obvious idea that some people come to is that simply God lied to the people, and I would say this is definitely not what the passage is saying, because Jeremiah himself didn't believe that God was was a wicked God. He believed that he was a good God, and that's kind of a self refuting thing too. So so for God to lie when he's not a liar, like that just kind of, we know that that's not what he's saying. He says in other par parts, you know, like, for instance, I'm not a man that I should lie. So <laughs> why would he then turn around and be like, yeah, just kidding, I'm a liar. Um, another view, it's God's fault for allowing false prophets to mislead the people. So because the false prophets were saying, hey, there's going to be peace, and there really wasn't peace, and God didn't, like, strike them dead when they gave the false prophecies, somehow that means that it's God's fault. And um, so he allowed the people to be misled by the false prophets. I don't know. That doesn't really sound overly true. I'd say that's probably not the way it is. Um, another another idea is that Jeremiah's grief led to him falsely accusing God because he was so distraught over this message of, of destruction from the north. He's just like, ah, you deceived the people. And God's like, well, hold on. I didn't really deceive. What are you, what are you, you know how when you're really upset, like he'll accuse somebody of somebody that, something that they didn't really do? Um, I would say that that's also probably not what's happening. Um, a possible idea from my opinion that once again you guys can come to your own conclusions this is my my opinion um god sent a spirit of deception we've seen that before um in the end times for instance there'll be a spirit that god's not not a spirit like a demon but like an attitude a um uh, an illusion that covers over people um uh of de deception that they'll believe the fall of the antichrist and they'll you know believe this stuff um, or with Pharaoh when he's leading the people out of out of out of captivity in Exodus, it says that God hardened his heart. Um, or when King Ahab is is has all these false prophets, and uh, this prophet comes and says, you know, um, God has sent has sent this 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 confusion among your false prophets that they would mislead you to go into battle. So we have seen that before. So that is possible. I don't think that that's the right one though, but it is possible. Um, another idea, because God was patient in punishment, he didn't bring punishment to Judah when they deserved it. He, he, he gave them patience and gave them patience and gave them patience. Because God did that, 
it gave them a false assurance. Like, oh, if God really cared, he would have done something by now. And so the prophets and the people, they had the majority view. Like, oh, we all believe this, so that must make it right. And since God didn't bring the punishment, they were like, yeah, we're good. Um, that's possible. Um, another one is uh, because God was giving them a hope of renewal. Hey, if you turn, knowing that they wouldn't turn. So basically, like, hey, um, let's say I'm God and you're Josie. Okay, Josie, if you go straight home tonight, um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, car gonna car you're not gonna die. And then you say, well, I'm not gonna do that though. And I already know you're not gonna do that. So then you go and do something, die or whatever. You get what I'm saying? Like yeah. where it's like God's not necessarily, God didn't necessarily lie to them. He just said, if you do this, knowing that they weren't gonna, weren't gonna do it. You know what I mean? But I would like to add on that you guys both had, I, I, I think, really good answers, too, that I didn't consider. So I, I'm not saying that your, your ideas don't have any mer merit to them. I'm definitely not saying that. Uh, the priests and the prophets were encouraging the leaders and people with promises of no judgment. Oh, that you know, you're not going to be judged. Everything's going to be fine. Um, and they were completely confused when they were wrong. They, they had so huffed their own, you know, whatever, you know, drank their own Kool-Aid or whatever, that um, they were completely confused when they were wrong. So Jeremiah 4, 11 through 13. Would you mind reading that? At that time, as you say to the people of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem a what was it? Searing. Searing report <laughs> from the barren heights of the wilderness on the way to make you wonder. Come to that hill and I will work with fair hands. It will be wind. Wind too strong for the strength of my hand. Now I will also pronounce judgments against them and float Float to the advances like clouds, to chariots are like a storm, to horses are swifter than eagles, those who are for you are with you. So the hot desert wind is what he's talking about here. Um, if uh, if you ever go to Israel, you'll you'll definitely see this. There's this really hot, strong wind that comes blowing through there, and uh, it uh, it wasn't really good for anything. It kind of just destroyed everything, it blew everything away. So when they were, if they were winnowing or, or going through the grains, it would just kind of ruin everything that they were working on. You don't you don't go out in that wind. You don't you don't work on it. It's very hot, very very strong. Just ugh. Um, and uh, so the idea of winnowing and sifting, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these terms, but that's how they separated the grain. They had like this process of they would play, they would you know pick it and then go to it and they'd sift it out where they'd get all the crap out from it. Um, and then uh, so he's talking about a complete destruction on the people, not simply a spanking for their character. You know the difference being um, my kid does something wrong and I try to teach him or try to discipline him or something like that versus my kid does something wrong and I throw him out of the house and just like all oh, hell rains down. You know what I mean? That's the kind of the difference that's going on here. This isn't God saying you're going to get a spanking. This is like oh things are about bad things are about to happen. Wash the evil from your heart, Jerusalem, so that you will be delivered. How long will you harbor malicious thoughts? For a voice announces from Dan, proclaiming malice from Mount Ephraim, warn the nations, look, proclaim to Jerusalem, those who besiege are coming from a distant land. They raise their voices against the cities of Judah. So there's a few things going on here. First off, Dan, it says there, Dan. Dan was one of the tribes, but it was also uh, the farthest north of the cities in, in Israel. It was the like, farthest north you could go. Uh, and so they would have seen the coming destruction first, is the idea here. You know, Dan proclaiming malice. Uh, and then Mount Ephraim uh, was just north of Judah. So you can see, like, the idea that the destruction is coming down hits Dan first, being the farthest north, and then goes to the mountains of Ephraim, and Jerusalem's in Judah. So it's like the, the destruction is coming. They're, it's being, they're being warned. It's, ah, everything's going bad very quickly. Um, and this is written in such a way where it's almost as if they can already hear the attackers um, there. And this is going to be a problem for Jeremiah because he's going to, God's going to keep giving him these visions of, of what's about to happen. And so he's carrying the weight of knowing what's happening before it happens. And it's just, it's just driving him to despair. He's getting super, super depressed about it. And uh, he's at the next section after this one's going to, going to show uh, uh, Jeremiah kind of having a little bit of a, uh, a meltdown. So here it says in this in this translation, warn the nations, look, proclaim to Jerusalem. That's not overly accurate. It, it should read something more like this. Um, proclaim concerning Jerusalem. So the idea here is warn the nations, look, proclaim to them about Jerusalem that those who besiege you are coming from this land. So it's not really, hey, Judah. It's more of, hey, guys, look at what's about to happen over there. Um, so then Jeremiah 4, 17 through 18. You want to take that? Those who dwell in fields because 
She. She has skipped all the dates here. This is more decoration than way than in the actions of Scott or Kanye. This is a color choice for the very bitter because it has reached their heart. Or another way of saying that it, is it pierces their heart. Either way, the idea is there. This is something that's very bitter. I mean, it's pretty, pretty, pretty plain, uh, plain meaning. So a, a few things that I want to highlight from this section that we read. First off, repentance won't always get rid of the problem. We have this idea that um, that if you just say sorry, like no harm, no foul. Um, it, the deleted part of my note. So, for instance, in the part it says um, to, that they should put on sackcloth and mourn and well for the Lord's burning anger has not burned, uh, has not turned away from us uh, in uh, verse like 8 or something. And the thing is, God didn't relent because they didn't repent. That, that's, a, that's, that's the first thing. Um, they didn't repent, so he didn't, he didn't relent. But why repent? But even if they had repented, there's some times when a line is crossed and it's just God... The, the bad thing's still going to happen. Here's a good example. Like, let's say, let's say there's a zero tolerance policy for speeding in here. Right, now we all speed, so calm down. Okay, well, so let's just pretend hypothetically that we don't speed and there's a zero tolerance in, in New Mexico. There isn't, but let's just pretend that there is. And um, so we, we speed and we, we, we know that we should do something wrong. God convicts us and says, hey, you shouldn't be speeding or, you know, whatever. And so then uh, we, we still keep doing it. And then we get pulled over by a cop and he says, look, you know you shouldn't be doing that. You've been warned. You're still doing it. So at this point, he writes you a ticket. It's like, kind of like that. There's a point of no return. Um, so the question becomes, why repent if the bad thing won't go away? If, if you did something bad and you repent, but the bad thing doesn't go away, then why even repent in the first place? Okay. How so? Very true. Yep, 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 very true. Anybody else? No? Um, to get on good terms with God is a good reason for just for your spiritual sake. I mean, even if something bad happens, to still, you know, try to get on good terms with God. Um, so it won't be as bad in the future. God has a habit of showing mercy to people who, who repent, even if they still get what they deserve. It's still not as bad as they deserve. Um, another reason, so we can walk in peace with, with his strength. God gives us strength in, in these kinds of things. And uh, to obey God, I mean, there's a good reason right there. I mean, even if none of the punishment is taken away, God tells us to repent. He wants us to repent. So, I mean, obviously just obeying God is a good reason. Um, but the bad thing was happening because they didn't repent. So, it takes us to the next part here. Coming, pu coming, <laughs> coming punishment through Babylon was coming... Let me say that different, okay? Coming punishment through Babylon... Was God coming to punish? I should put some commas in there somewhere or something. I don't know. Uh, and the idea here is we sometimes get the get get the connect that something is. Um, we we kind of get this disconnect that something is from God. So um, when we say God speak to me, we want God to divinely speak to me where I hear a voice, right, an audible voice. But oftentimes when God does speak to us, maybe He'll give us the wisdom from a parent or. Um, life direction from someone in the church or you know maybe he'll remove finances where we're not able to make a certain decision these are all good examples of how god can speak if god it, wants you to go do something for instance he'll provide the funds for it like he won't just be like hey go do that and by the way i'm not going to give you the money to do it no how am i going to do that um not everything is directly caused by god though and i do want to make that make that clear i mean some i've seen people get sick by being rebellious to God. I have seen that. But that doesn't mean that every single person who gets sick is being rebellious to God. I mean, everybody gets sick. Um, so, that's kind of... But God does interact with the world, and he and he uh, does also use third-party means, so in everything that God doesn't interact with the world. Not every conqueror is punishment from God. Uh, when we don't live for God, we have pointless trials. Now, this is something that's very, very important as Christians. When we live for God, we have trials that grow our faith. But when we don't serve God, when we don't love God, we have trials that are just pointless trials. See, what Judah was about to go through, it wasn't going to grow their character. It was punishment. There was there was nothing. It was just punishment. You know, that was it. 
But when you serve God, there'll be these times like Paul for, is a great example. Can you get that? Paul is a great example of this, where he's serving God, he's doing what he's supposed to do, but he um, he is persecuted for it. He's uh, persecuted for it and mistreated for it, but it grows his character, where he's able to uh, be stronger and better than he would have been before, where he's able to be, uh, the gospel's able to go better, where he's, all these different things happen like that. So, uh, uh, when we live for God, we have trials that grow our faith. Okay, so... Uh, it was too late, but it was uh, also not too late. This sounds like a little bit of a contradiction, so I'll kind of ex explain a little bit, and I guess I'll explain by asking a question. Was it too late, or is it ever too late, for Judah to have turned and repented? No. Well, okay, go ahead and elaborate on that. Ha-ha! <laughs> Say the question again? Say the question again? <laughs> was it, yeah. <laughs> was it too late for him to, like, repent? Is it, is it ever too late to turn away and to turn to God? Okay. Like, you can, like, be like, oh, I don't know. Or, like, think about it. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Like, they'll, like, think about it. Oh, maybe. I feel like it's not. Like, mm -hmm. if you genuinely mean it, mm -hmm. I feel like there's not a time to do it. Okay. Gracie, it looked like you were about to say something. Would you not? I was going to add, say, no, it's not. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, there's so many things that can happen. Wow. For instance, I had a great great grandpa or great great uncle. I can't remember which one it was. And he was very, you know, said that he would always wait for his deathbed to ask God into uh -huh. his life because he didn't want to change. And he died instantly of heart attack. Oh, wow. So we don't know if maybe while he was thinking that he was going to die, if he has God in his heart or not. You know how sometimes people say that it's like time slows down? Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. So, I mean, like, you hope that he had time or he did, you know, that day before he died, but you never know, and it's it, it's never good to wait and say, oh, I'll ask God for things later. Were you, were you going to say something? Dude, like, when, like, Ed, like, have you ever heard, like, this, like, like, one time, like, remember whenever I told my mom right here, like, I was falling off the tree? Uh-huh. Everything was slow motion, like, I was falling in slow motion, I was like, wow, this is cool. But all that you were thinking during that slow motion was, oh, crap. So was it being too late or was it not too late? Here's the thing. Here's my opinion, okay? It, he very clearly says in this that punishment is coming. But then he very also clearly says, wash your heart. So cleanse yourself. Okay. So he's obviously talking about repenting while he's saying that the punishment is still coming. And this is what I think. It's never too late to repent if you are alive, but... That doesn't mean that the consequences can always be avoided. Right. It's never too late to repent, but it sometimes it's too late to avoid consequences. Because you don't know when you die. Like, don't say, oh, I could repent tomorrow, but you could die, like, the day or, like, you know. Right. Exactly. And and uh, that that is exactly my point, is, is it's never too late to repent if you're alive, but there are the consequences are not always avoidable. If we repent, God's mercy can surprise us. I will say that. Um, God eventually gives us what we wanted. Now, this is, this is not a good thing. Uh, we want our way. We want no restrictions. Then, we want to get, then when we get it, it's not what we wanted in the first place. Like, you don't know how many times I, I've um, counseled different people where, you know, oh, I don't, I don't love my husband. He's just a jerk. He this, he that, that, that. So then he che they cheat on, on their husband with this other guy that they think is going to fix all their problems and, and make them happy. And then, you know, oh, oh, it's so great and everything. But then they feel all guilty and then they're all, but then they finally get over that. And no, it's fine. I, I didn't do anything wrong. And then they reach this point of just like, this guy is such a jerk. It's like, well, he was willing to cheat on you. I mean, cheat on your husband with you. I mean, he couldn't have been that great of a guy, right? And uh, so sometimes God gives us what we want, and we find out that it's not really what we wanted. Um, they didn't want God's restrictions and protection, but then they also didn't want the punishment that comes without having God's restrictions and protection. Um, they cast it off and said they wouldn't serve, and then here they are with a little bit of a pickle. So, uh, Dylan, are you comfortable with reading aloud? Yeah. Okay. You want to read that? You're in class. What was the first word? My. Okay. It's okay. I had to do the same thing with yeah, him. No, it's, it's, it's I have no idea how to get rid of that yet. I'll try to work on it in the future. That was good. My English, my English, I write in Agni, O 
the pain in my heart, my heart's pound, I cannot be silent, for you my soul has heard the sound of the next ram's horn, the shout of battle, disaster after disaster is reported because the whole land is destroyed. Suddenly my tent is destroyed, my tent's curtain in a moment. How long must I see the signal flag and hear the sounds of the ram's horn? So here we have Jeremiah talking. This isn't God talking. This is this is Jeremiah talking, and he really shows his heart. He's got this this complete affliction about his message. He's not happy about destruction. We've all had those 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 experiences with these religious folk that they're just like picketing funerals or whatever. And they're just like, "You're gonna burn in hell!" Ha ha ha! And it's like, okay, calm down. Like that's definitely not Jeremiah's heart in this. He, you see him definitely afflicted in his spirit, and it's it's not just. It's not just in his spirit, though. He's gonna have, he's gonna lose his vloggings. He's gonna lose his physical health and his life. Things are not going good, and uh, Jeremiah would actually share in the suffering of Judah, even though he wasn't doing anything wrong. When the city of Jerusalem was besieged by Babylon, where was Jeremiah? He was in Jerusalem, in the in the middle of that, running out of food with the rest of them. He hadn't done anything wrong, but he was still sharing in the suffering, and uh, he's seeing it happening and coming. But he can't stop it. There's nothing he can do to stop it. And it, it, he just wants it to be over. Oh, we, I writhe in agony. Oh, the pain. If this would just end. So, uh, Eli, yeah. if you could go that one. Okay. For my people are fools. They do not know me. They are foolish children without understanding. They are skilled in doing what is evil. evil but they do not know to do what is good. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty. I looked to the heaven, and no light was flowing. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking, all this, all the hills. So here we have God speaking in the first half, and Jeremiah again speaking in the, in the second half. And if you notice, when after God says his thing, and Jeremiah starts talking again, he says, I looked at the earth, and it was formless and void. We have a reversal of creation. So if you guys have ever read Genesis 1, 1, it talks about how when the heavens and earth were created, earth was formless and void. And it talks about all that. So here we have a complete reversal. And this is hinting towards the end times as well. He's not just talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. He's also talking about the destruction of the earth at the, at the end times too. Um, so then, uh, Gracie. I looked. I looked and there was no human being. And all the birds of the sky had flight. I looked and the fertile fields, uh, fields were the wilderness. All its cities. Cities were torn. So here we have again switches back to God speaking here at the end. Um, so I, Isaiah and Jeremiah is the one talking. I looked and there was no human being, and all its cities were torn down because the Lord is burning air. But then it switches back to to God for this is what the Lord says. The whole okay, and then that takes us to this section here. Uh, Josie, if you could do that. Wait, hold on. Did I skip one? Okay, we're good. Go ahead. I hear a cry like a woman in labor, a cry of anguish like one, like one bearing her first child. The cry of daughter Zion, gasping for breath, stretching out her hands. Woe is me, for my life is weary because of, of the murderers. So here we have uh, Judah trying to form an alliance, trying to somehow, you know, avert this. Instead of repenting, they're just trying to maybe work their way out of it. They can fix this problem if they just try hard enough. I mean, I, I've been there before. You know, if, if I just use my own smarts, I can get myself out of this problem. I can just solve all my problems if I just trust in my own strength. And it, obviously it doesn't work, but... Um, and they're trying to face the threat. They're trying to outwit Babylon or simply deny that it's a threat, which I don't even understand how they were able to deny it. The, I mean, there's a giant army on their way, and you're going to, like, play dumb. I'm reminded of uh, of Paris in World War II when they're just like, Germany's not going to invade us. And then, yeah, they just marched into Paris, and all the people in Paris are just like, Germany invaded us. The nerve. So uh, a few things to point out. Punishment um, was coming because of the removal of the covenant that they had rejected. So the covenant was given to Abraham and Moses to bring restoration to broken and sinful people through faith in God. 
the same as the new covenant through Jesus was supposed to do. And, uh, but the abandonment of that covenant, when Israel abandoned that covenant, it only brought ruin and pointless living. Um, it looked like a complete destruction to the prophets, but Jeremiah talked about the land being empty. And uh, God said he wouldn't bring a, a, but throughout all this, God said that he wouldn't bring a complete destruction. I don't know if you guys noticed that on, 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 the, on that part that we read. The whole land will be a desolation, but it will not, he will not finish it off. And so to, to the prophets, it looked like there was no hope. It looked like the complete destruction. But in the middle of all that destruction that they're saying, God still said, hey, um, yes, there is going to be punishment. That they, yes, all that. But I'm not going to completely finish it off. There's still going to be uh, people who live. Um, we, give, we live in a society where the appearance of justice and righteousness is all around while rebelling, while people rebel to God. So it, he said in this section, he said that they're only good at doing the wrong thing. I, I'm reminded of, of modern day actors who lecture us on climate change while they endorse abortion. Or, you know, they get on their high horse and they say, oh, this and that. And it's like, well, okay. So they're, they're masters about how to save the climate, how to save the planet, how to, you know, have a better car and all these different things, how to make more money. But then at the end of the day, morality, they have none. No morality. And they, they can justify any number of atrocities. And it's totally fine, but then the second that is something that they want, then all of a sudden it's, you know. Um, or I'm also reminded of, of growing up in the church, I met a lot of people who call themselves Christians, who they just gossiped and, and committed adultery and all these different stuff. And then the whole time they're instructing others how to live their best life or live your truth and tell how, you're, how you are enough and how you have to put yourself first. And so they're trying to be teachers, but they don't even know what they believe. And then they're trying to tell everybody else what to believe. And uh, I'm just reminded of that kind of stuff. And I think that's kind of what God's talking about, where people make their own standards of right and wrong. And people say, hey, you know what? Um, we don't have to live by God's standard. But, I mean, I mean, look all around us. There's all this social unrest, all these riots and stuff about, you know, uh, rights and equality and all this different stuff. But the whole time, there's rebellion towards God. It's like, how can you, how can you parade, oh, we've got equality, when the whole time... It's based on just rebellion and, 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 and sin. So next week we'll look at Jeremiah 5. Um, what? All right. Uh, and now I do want to, in closing, I guess, is one more comment I want to make. There's a lot of people who claim that God's message is hateful. But the, I've noticed that the people who claim God's message is hateful are the most hateful towards anyone who disagree with them. Right? So coexist, coexist was like, well, that's actually impossible because the different religions, you know, they, you know, oh, well, no, 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 no. and, you know, it's like, well, okay, like, here's a good example. Uh, somebody was all talking about coexisting the other day, and uh, they were in the parking lot yelling and shouting and all and cussing at these other people. I was reading a book at uh, about this person who was talking about, um, talking about marriage and, and stuff, and, and a person uh, cussed, cussed this pastor out and said, uh, it's about love. F, 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 F. And I said, calm down. And it's like, you know, you, you want to talk about how it's about love, but you're not showing them love. And it's like, you know, oh, okay. sorry. Whatever. Um, and there's this idea, oh, everyone's going to heaven, and I'm going to talk to you like you're trash. Okay. Actually, some, I, I, some, this was a conversation that I had just the other day. Uh, this was a conversation I had the other day. That this this girl was, was, was very upset about something, and I was trying to talk to her, and she's all, um, talking about how people basically didn't need Jesus because anybody could go to heaven. I was like, so what's the point of him even even dying, you know? And the whole time she's yelling and talking to me and swearing at me and all this different stuff, and I'm just like, so you you think you think everybody, you know, should be loving and everything, but you don't think that you have to be loving to me for not agreeing with you. So you only have to love people who agree with you. Didn't Jesus say that even the Pharisees could do that? Anyways, so if you want to be ahead of the curve, read Jeremiah 5 for next week.